Hi, and welcome to Boldly Now. Uh, this is Michael Sean Conaway, and I have the great pleasure of introducing Forrest Landry today. He and I are going to have a conversation. I think you'll find some uh, deep meaning and deep content in what he has to say. Uh, Forrest is a researcher, an author, a philosopher, and a systems design architect. Forrest, thank you for joining us, and welcome to Boldly Now. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Um, Forrest, you know, in this time, um, like we've all had various impacts from the pandemic, you know, from, from you know, things that are, uh, you know, painful and tragic within our own communities and families uh, on a global level. Um, you know, we've had changes in our, our, you know, ability to go outside of our own homes or get access to food or uh, economics, a lot of disruption going on right now. Uh, you know, what's going on with you? How are you doing? Uh, what, what, are, what is going on in your world? Well, one of the actually beneficial outcomes, at, at least for me, was just that it, it, it gave me a real chance to just focus. I mean, I, I tend to be uh, doing more research and on the computer and working at home anyway. So, you know, when the stay at home order came in, uh, you know, I saw it as, a, as an opportunity to do some really good focus design work and to, and to really drill down on, on the kinds of issues that COVID-19 is, is an example of, right? So, for example, you know, we have these chronic situations and how do we respond to them in a way that prevents it from becoming an acute crisis. So in a lot of ways, um, you know, kind of looking at what happened with uh, and what, what is currently happening with, with the, you know, the pandemic and such like that, it's actually helped me to understand more about the work that I'm doing. And, and, and in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's been, at least in that sense, something that I've, I've been able to turn to positive outcomes, at least, you know, personally. And, um, uh, you know, so, so, I mean, it's funny, like extroverts are, are screaming about being locked in a prison and introverts are like, well, this isn't so bad. <laughs> and I, I, I could actually resonate with both, um, you know, when I'm working like you and if I'm really got my focus on something, I just, I, I love the hours and hours and hours of, of time to stay focused. Um, but beyond the port personal, you know, like what are you seeing going on out there right now? What are the things that are, are kind of alarming you? surprisingly alarming you maybe i think that obviously there's some alarming things going on that everybody's you know clearly about clearly understanding and then maybe what are some things that um that are that are i don't want to say hopeful but but seem like an opening out there uh today well one of the things that i'm finding that's really on my mind and it's connected to this uh this, this COVID 19 thing is, is is basically the relationship between man machine and nature and so in effect you know with 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 the virus itself, it's a, it's a manifestation of nature. So in other words, you know, the, the, the culture is effectively having an encounter with the non-negotiable. You know, nature is going to do basically what it's going to do. And, and, and to some extent, we have to account for that. And so, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, when I'm, when I'm looking at the long-term progression of things, and I'm trying to basically say, okay, what kinds of things are essentially going to develop a right relationship between man, machine, and nature? Um, then, then in a lot of ways, what I'm looking at is the kind of social dynamics that essentially allow for that that right relationship to emerge. Hmm. So, in, in a certain sense, we can't make nature something else, right? We we can try. I mean, you know, we've we've obviously learned how to do uh, a lot of things with farming and and you know bridge construction and all sorts of stuff. But but basically, you know, the laws of physics are are just going to be what they are. And 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 so there's there's certain aspects of the of the human condition which are also going to be largely immutable right we're not necessarily going to change the basic conditions but one thing we can do which is which has actually been you know a lot of where my emphasis is doing is, is we can you know there's 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 elements of what it means to be human which are virtual um which are learned at birth which are learned in the first you know decade of one's life and um, so in effect, the cultures that we live in, the kinds of systems that we manage, uh, you know, things like markets and how governance works and, and you know, the way culture basically helps us to have a tool set or a set of techniques for dealing with things like food and shelter and, and you know, communication and stuff like that. Um, and so in effect, you know, when, when we're looking at the kind of dynamics that COVID-19 is doing is, 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 is it's revealing a profile of both what doesn't work and what could work, right? So, for instance, it's like it's helping us to see uh, the parts of the of the social dynamics which which obviously are, haven't been that effective at dealing with the situation. Um, but it also gives us 
you know, in, in, in sort of reviewing and looking at these kinds of things, you know, deeper insights into the kinds of things that could work. Um, you know, what, what would have been necessary in order to have been able to adapt to this. So, for instance, everywhere in the world, uh, different countries have taken different approaches to, um, you know, this, this particular pandemic. And so, in effect, we're, we've, we've, we're, whether uh, people intended to or not, you know, all of these different governments are effectively conducting experiments right. uh, in the space of, of, of how governance and nature interact with one another. Um, and so, in effect, there's, there's, there's actually some really interesting uh, observations that we can make about, you know, how culture can and cannot deal with these sorts of things and what kinds of things we need to think about creating long-term conscious sustainable evolution for not only our species, but, but ecosystems on the planet. So in, in, in that particular sense, you know, I, I find myself thinking a lot about, you know, the ways in which, you know, companies create, uh, you know, entanglements to essentially enable extraction or the way that, you know, there's a kind of uh, political process that may or may not um, actually be facilitating conversation, you know, or, or fence making that's necessary to solve problems. Um, and, and so in a lot of ways, it's not just designing good sense making systems to inform choices, it's also seeing what are the cultural preconditions in which that sense making process can exist. Right. Um, and, and to facilitate that, and, and one of the things that's, that's really been exciting for me personally is that, you know, as, I, as I've come to sort of learn the ways in which uh, things don't work, I've also uh, you know, been, been been able to use that as a kind of litmus test to see what sort of things are needed and could work, and 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 to effectively test out ideas. Um, and 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 so, in a, in a lot of ways, there's been, um, as, as I said, as as I become more aware of the issues, it makes it more possible for me to be aware of the solutions. Um, and that's actually very exciting. You know, if I if I had had, you know, not done as much as I had, I wouldn't have been prepared. Um, to, to really see those nuances and to pick out those ideas, uh, this, this whole situation would have been very discouraging. But on the other hand, um, you know, at, at this point, having worked on it a while, I've found ways to think about this that, that, that are actually seeming to work out. And um, that's, that's been, at least in, in, in my personal sense of feeling and relationship to the world and, and the things that are going on, uh, you, even though there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that uh, for sure could be better, it, it, I, I personally, at this point, have have considerable hope. And and you know, considering that you like you and and others have you know talked for a long time about uh, you know some of the fragility in our system and the possibility of a pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for years, you know, how have we done? I mean, like you, you've kind of thought about this moment coming, and obviously we're having a pandemic that's not got like a thirty percent mortality rate or something, you know, completely human devastating like that. But you know what, what you know, like I think because so many so many people right now feel like oh my god this is a complete disaster, um, is it a complete disaster or is it somewhere not quite that bad? Uh, I I I'm, I think it's far short of a of a complete disaster. I I you know for, first of all you know we, we we have to recognize that as as far as things go I mean in in, in the overall schema of of existential risks or of things that you know could collapse civilization or cause real problems. Uh, this is basically it's a shot across the bow. It's a, it's 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 relatively slow moving. I mean, you know, if we were looking at some sort of you know war situation, things like that, you'd you'd have much more change happening, in a much much shorter period of time, and it would feel much more traumatic. Um, you know, all all things considered, you know, this this is emerging over a period of a couple of months, and um, you know, I'm I'm living in California, and and, and California, at least uh, you know the northern parts. Uh, you know, took a fairly aggressive approach, and I, and I think that's worked out reasonably well. I mean, I, I, in, in in my circles of experience and people that I know, and so on and so forth, um, the impact has been modest. Um, but again, I think that the people were really pretty diligent about it. I was I was surprised, for example, when, um, you know, when the order came out to basically do shelter in place and to stay at home and stuff like that, that most people did. Um, you know, g given that, uh, you know, there was essentially a request to shut down. Well, like half of the half of the economy, um, you know, most business leaders and, and, and most people, workers and stuff like that, um, you know, were actually quite compliant and, and, and did the things of, of, of doing that, even though it was in, in a lot of cases quite costly to peace, people personally. Hmm. Um, and, and so I think the willingness to cooperate has been 
uh, demonstrated, uh, you know, far more profoundly than than than, than most people would, would would really point to. And and you know, it's it's very easy to look at, you know, all the confrontations that occur at the margins. You know, at the you know most uh, highly placed public people and and also the people that are that are closest to the earth that are you know the, the, the so-called so out of sight rich and uh, out of sight poor you know obviously those are um, and very impacted in, in certain respects but um, you know for the for the people that are adjacent to that that are that are, that are highly visible um, you know it would look like there's a tremendous amount of conflict and a tremendous amount of problems and and, and so on but you know, for the for the vast majority of what's going on in the, in the middle, there's 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 quite a bit of cooperation, and I, I think that it's very easy to overlook that. Um, you know, when I when I look at it at a national level, I have to admit I'm not that particularly impressed. But on the other hand, I didn't have that many expectations about a, a, an effective national response. I think that to some extent, you know, we 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 really want to uh, recognize that necessary and sufficient to you know, to think about a good, effective response. Those are two very different orders of thinking, and they themselves are kind of different orders of thinking than, than say, a large institution would be able to do. Um, so, so in a lot of ways, you know, I, I had, in, in thinking about institutional design and thinking about systems design and so on and so forth, had, had already kind of, um, you know, recognized that things that involve public broadcast just wouldn't be very good sense-making frameworks and just really wouldn't be contributing to sense-making frameworks. And, and so to the degree that that's what most people are experiencing, they're, they're, gonna, they're obviously going to have their sense-making dismayed and, dis, and, and fragmented, and, 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 and so things are going to seem a lot worse than they actually are. Um, this isn't to say that there isn't uh, substantial impacts. I mean, obviously, on an economic level and on a social level, um, you know, some of these changes are quite profound. Um, but on the other hand, you know, compared to some of the things that, that, that we end up thinking about uh, far more often than, than, than maybe comfortable, this is actually, you know, on the very low end of, of, of a lot of the things that we're concerned with. Yeah. And yet you mentioned, uh, you know, sense making and, and some of the troubles we have with that right now. You know, there seems like there's been a, a, for a number of years now, and, and maybe for much longer than I can even appreciate, maybe up to 20 years, there's been a a concerted effort to dismantle trustworthy systems or, or kind of who we can rely on for trustworthy information. You know, I think first it was, you know, intellectuals, academics, and scientists. We, we, we kind of decided to take them down and suddenly they're no longer trustworthy, left and right. I mean, uh, you know, the left has this great thing of saying, well, you're, on, you're under the employ of, of some, you know, big business, so we can't trust you anymore. And the right, we can't trust you because you're under the thumb or under the employ of some environmental group or whatever. We always have some way to dismantle trust in, in a group of people at large, which of course is hard to have trust at a group of people at large anyway. And then, and then most recently, I think with the rise of social media and the, and the you know, kind of vilification of, of, of you know, the press, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's bewildering a little bit how little trust we can have in any information source. Do you think this is a um, a unique period in time, or just kind of an ebb and flow in the way uh, information happens in in the in the public world? I mean, are we really well, at a bad time? It seems like it's kind of dark to me. Yeah, there's um, there's there's definitely historical precedence. You know, so for instance, if if you look at um, you know the overall flow and life cycle of civilizations. When things get kind of late stage, and so you know we're we're not late stage yet, but when they when they start getting into the space where you're starting to look at late stages, um, the the sort of disinformation process and the uh, breakdown of 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 the kind of information systems that that, that sort of run governance system and things like that, um, they, they look like this. I mean, this is this is uh, you know unfortunately I, I I have to admit that that a lot of the things that we're seeing actually make sense to me in terms of a larger pattern. Um, and and there are I, I think in, in, that, that are unique to this situation. Um, you know, so so there's a couple things that are obviously unique. One of them is is that you know we have a world spanning culture at this particular point. I mean, there's there's communication entanglement that involve pretty much you know all of the earth. Um, and and so the sheer scope and scale of of that and the sheer involvement of that, I think has has some novel features. And then technology itself as a as a process has obviously 
accelerated this in dimensions, so it's speeding up the curve on, on, on how long this, this progression normally takes. Um, so, so on one hand, you know, when we're, when we're looking at things like trust and we're basically saying, okay, well, in, in a situation where we're no longer finding ourselves uh, trusting the social contract or we're no longer finding ourselves trusting institutions and so on and so forth, then, then you know, what do we trust? You know, where are the places um, that, that, that we, find a, we find a capacity to build, um, you know, relationships that actually work? So, so what does trust mean? Well, a, a, a couple things that, that I think may be obvious to some people, but the, the idea is, is that it's not just what I can think through with, with clarity and, and, and logic and rigor and so on and so forth, i.e. it's got to make sense some sort of conceptual level you know, correspondence of what they said and what they did and all those kinds of things. It's, it's also got to be something that I can rely on in the sense of what I do. Hmm. For instance, there's, a, there's an actionable component to trust as well. Um, so, you know, when we're, when we're looking at, you know, can I trust this enough that, that when I'm basically making decisions about resource allocations, I'm not, you know, making mistakes. And, and that could be, you know, time invested and things like that. That, that in effect what we're, what we're looking to do is be very skillful. And, you know, in a lot of ways, when, when, we're, when we're talking about things like, you know, how to basically prepare for situations or how to, uh, you know, respond to things like COVID-19 and so on and so forth, uh, we're identifying that skillfulness is not something that lives just in the individual uh, or just in the institution, but actually needs to live in the community. And so, you know, the network of relationships that are local, i.e. your relationship with your family, your relationship with, the, you know, from one family to the next, your neighbors and, and, and the people that basically live in, in the geographical region. Like, do we know how to actually cooperate with one another? Do we have enough skillfulness as a community to be able to respond to situations that require a response at a community level? And, and so, in effect, you know, when we're, we're looking at um, you know market dynamics and political dynamics and things like that. There's this there's this momentum to try to continually increase scale. The sort of phenomenon of globalization. Well, if I if I can create a market that's larger, and you know I'm basically earning money on every transaction. You know I get a percentage of all of the exchanges. Of course, I want to make the market as large as possible. I want to make money move quickly. I want to make resources flow through the system so that as a result, I can extract a little bit of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the idea is, is that when you when you have a, a situation where there's a pandemic or where you have a situation that requires, you know, real response, um, you know, again, individuals can't really do very much by themselves and institutions aren't really positioned in a place to be able to do it because they're, they're operating at the wrong level. They're at the level of the state. And so in, a, in effect, what we need to do is to regain and redevelop skillfulness at a community level so that um, you know, we can we can develop the kinds of capacities, right? If I if I don't have the capacity to bond, then 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 my skillfulness is 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 not going to help me to use and to be able to integrate trust. Right. So in other words, my my capacity to trust another person is partly dependent upon my skillfulness, not just in terms of how well I can determine whether or not they're trustworthy, but how well I can integrate the actionable information, actually use that information to do things that need to be done in a coordinated way at a local level. So uh, a lot of the things that I'm, that I'm thinking about are, are, first of all, a kind of educational uh, process where we help people to identify entrapments. We help people to identify things like cults or, or bad relationships or places where their skillfulness is low and therefore failing them, um, you know, where, where, where disease and, and health is essentially being, you know, disease is creeping in and health is being lost because they don't have the awareness of the kinds of preconditions that would, you know, that they would need to be mindful of in order to adapt and to, to essentially be able to respond to something rather than be blindsided by it. Um, and, and obviously this isn't something that a lot of people are focused on right now, but on the other hand, it is something that I'm increasingly finding to be essential for, for our future, uh, both in the sense of Developing, you know, coherent visions of what it means to live in in the world in a, in a uh, you know, an adaptive way and to, um, you know, thrive, essentially. Um, you know, so when we're looking at, you know, creating a vision of what a community is going to be like or what it's going to be like to live um, 
you know, 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, and so on and so forth, what the right balance between man, machine, and nature actually looks like and what it feels like and how we implement that and so on and so forth. Um, I'm finding that a lot of our a lot of our attention needs to come back to the kind of skillfulness of what it means to be a human being, what it means to have authentic relationship, what it means to be engaged in clear communication, and to have the skillfulness of those things essentially create the propensities not only to be able to live in the futures that we're describing, uh, but also to be able to um, you know, navigate from where we are to those places. Yeah, so there's a, a an up, upgrade or an up-leveling of my own competencies and, competencies and capacities to make relationships, uh, to, to probably have vulnerability and intimacy to actually have a, uh, an exchange of information that's more than, uh, you know, posturing or, or, or these kinds of things. That's and precise. Then kind of, and then maybe a, an expansion of my consciousness, my ability, the ability to hold more than just my own concerns, hold the concerns of my neighbors, hold the concerns of my community a little bit larger. And without without putting yourself at disadvantage to do so. So, for instance, I, I think that, you know, one, one of the things people get confused by a little bit is that it's not an all or nothing thing that we're talking about here. It's 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 not like if I basically become fully altruistic, then then everything will be great. But unfortunately, when I do that, you know, I'm I, I'm not accounting for the fact of human conditions that, that don't change underlying, um, you know, game A dynamics that effectively will co-opt. Um, you know, well-intentioned people into into you know um, things that are that are not very good, right? So so we we've, we've seen places where where good intentions aren't enough. You need a you need a kind of competency to 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 recognize what is the right balance. What is the what is the wisdom that that acts as a as a guidepost or the principles of the the, the, the sort of um, ways of thinking that allow us to navigate complicated social situations complicated environmental situations to real solutions. You know, this is part of the sense making process, but, but but you alluded to it a minute ago when you when you were basically talking about relationships and skillfulness. Um, you know, if, if we're talking about trust, if we make an agreement, um, you know, to meet at a certain time and to engage in a certain activity and so on and so forth, the the strength of that agreement, whether it be a you know a constitutional agreement or a personal agreement as to, as to meet such as we are, to trust those agreements, we have to look at the context in which those agreements exist, right? So if I have a business and I'm looking at the business as being like a network of agreements, sales contracts, employment contracts, tax codes, and all the rest of that stuff, um, or I'm in a social community and I've made agreements about who's going to wash the dishes, all of those agreements depend upon the strength of the relationships that uphold them. Hmm. If I make a uh, an agreement over what we're going to do next year, but in the interim, you and I basically move to some other place, and and now we never see each other anymore. Um, then then the agreement can't hold because the relationship has failed, right? The, 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 so the strength of the trust that we can have in our agreements is contingent upon the strength of the relationships that we have. There's a kind of need to shift our skillfulness into how to have good relationships. Um, but but then when we look at that and we say well what is the strength of a relationship based on well obviously there's a kind of continuity if I if I see you today but I never see you again then relationship is, is is limited to the to the time that we've actually been in communication with one another and that and that basically highlights that communication as a practice as the living dynamic of our relatedness is the basis of the relationship so. How can we communicate in a way that is beautiful, that is artful, that is clear, that is welcoming, that, that effectively uh, contributes to the potentiality of the relationship in the future, as well as being dynamic in the actuality of how that relationship is now? Um, so, you know, and, 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 what, and we can talk about, you know, principles of good communication, you know, the, 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 the notion of grant you the right to speak, right to be understood, and the right to know that you have been understood. And then when each person in a, in a relationship grants those three rights freely and unconditionally to the other person, then communication in a genuine sense becomes possible. So, you know, we can, we can identify these kinds of things and, and begin to sort of recognize the principles and the practices that enable communities to, to essentially be vibrant places and to essentially thrive. And we don't have to make assumptions about 
you know, any specific technological capability. And we don't have to make assumptions about, you know, changing the basic nature of what it is to be a human. What we are doing is, is we're identifying capacities that are already present, right. both in the nature of, 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 of systems that we can build and in the nature of, of, of innate biological capacities. Um, so, you know, on one hand, when I was first working on these kinds of problems, I was basically saying, oh, wow, technology is pretty toxic. And, and humans are, you know, they're pretty predatorial. They, they, don't, they don't relate very well in a, one another. Um, you know, how do, we, how do we create a solution in this space with these really hard problems at the, at the, at the boundaries? Um, and, and, and one of the things that I've, as, as I've been indicating that I've, that I've come to understand and that I've come to discover is that um, actually there are ways to solve a problem even with those conditions, even with those stringent limits. And, um, you know, that's, that's been... Uh, you know, as, as, I, as I'm sort of describing to you, some of the ways in which I'm thinking about this have have opened up a lot of doors in terms of, you know, how to approach these topics, how to think about ways in which to assist communities or assist people in, into having the skillfulness necessary to navigate the future. Yeah, interesting. A couple of things you provoked in my my thinking there. It's something about human beings as social animals and how. Um, you know, a lot of our thinking and maybe our health patterns, our body are determined by, you know, the five or 10 people we're closest to, the people we spend the most time with. And um, and then I thought, wow, if you, you know, that's a, like, a, there's a network in that, you know, like when we say we're social animals, we have a network of, of other humans that we uh, tend to travel with and think alike. But if you can upgrade that group of humans in any significant way or upgrade the individual players along the way or upgrade the connections like you were talking about now, the ability to have trust and interact. Um, uh, I love this notion of the, the, the right to, 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 to speak, the right to be understood and the right to, to know that you're understood. I think that's really beautifully put, by the way. I think it was really, really clear. We're going to hold on to that and give that to people. Um, but you're really talking about actually affecting or impacting networks of human beings and, and having a way for networks of human beings to upgrade, um, which was really exciting to me and I kind of get the connections around it. And, it, and then is there, a, is there a technological component of that? Is there a way to track that or to monitor the health of that or to know when our, our you know, know when we're, our, our networks are not producing vibrancy and health for both ourselves and the community? I mean, it just occurs to me that there's so much that I can't see about that, I mean, I have to trust that the people I'm with are feeding me good or feeding me growth or the things that I desire. But is there another component of that? Is there a capacity that we might be able to grow as human beings to, to track and monitor that and maybe even develop that skill? Well, I think so. I mean, I, I've, you know, at, at first I, again, looking at the balance of the relationships between man, machine, and nature, you're kind of asking, you know, can we rely on machines to help? And, and to some degree we can. I, I think that uh, again, there's there's a kind of balance between relying on machinery and and systems and software and stuff like that um, to to the degree that they compensate for our natural biases. Hmm. For example, as as biological creatures, we have a long evolutionary history, some of which was written in uh, to basically deal with circumstances that were very important for us to be able to deal with at the time. Obviously, in our current circumstances, some of those situations aren't as adaptive as they could be. Um, so in effect, we can we can sometimes, in, 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 again, in judicious ways, um, use technology as a kind of balancing point to compensate for psychological and sociological bias. So in effect, there's a there's a strengthening capacity that can be created. But on the other hand, if we create too much dependence on that, then then there's a kind of weakness. You know, you end up with a with a way for um, you know people who are uh, developers to essentially um, basically bound by uh, macroeconomic process, you know, be compelled to create systems that entrap people and that, this, you know, the, the, the cell phones and all the rest of the software all of a sudden becomes more of an addiction rather than an actual assistance. So instead of helping us to cope with our biases, they're in a sense feeding on them. Yeah. And so, you know, if, 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 we, if, we, if we don't recognize where th things like that are happening, uh, then, then we actually weaken ourselves. We, we weaken our capacities, and um, you know it, it, it doesn't uh, take very long before things start going seriously wrong. Uh, 
Tristan Harris spoke to this in, in some of his uh, more recent, well, I'm thinking over December, January period, um, where, you know, was talking about it's it's not so much that, that AI is a risk when it gets more intelligent than humans. It becomes a risk when it basically uh, surpasses our weakness, when it passes the threshold of it's able to basically disable us, hmm. um, then, then you know, it, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, more powerful than us. It only needs to be able to cater to our weaknesses, essentially, to become a real issue. And, and that threshold has been passed. So, so in, in a certain sense, you know, when, when we're looking at uh, a, te a technology and its use and, and, and things like that, you know, I, I tend to basically say there is a lot of potential here. But in order to take advantage of that potential, we have to change the environment in which that technology is being used. We have to change some of our concepts as to what that actually means. Yeah. Um, there's 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 kind of this broad spread assumption that that that, that we build technology for ourselves. That, that you know we build these machines, and that these machines are meant to be in service to the humans that built them. Hmm. Um, and that's just not actually the case. We 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 are needing to build technology that is in service to nature so that nature has the capacity to provide an environment and an ecosystem that we can live in. So, you know, in effect, we we can't do it directly with machinery. We have to do it in cooperation with nature. To some extent, machine needs to serve nature. And so there's a, you know, a, a, again, a whole different dynamic here. You know, people more or less assume that they can just have someone else deal with the programming and, and, and create the systems and the policies and the laws on their behalf. So we've crafted these representative systems and so on and so forth. And at this particular point, I'm basically saying, no, if it's, if it's actually going to be government for the people, by the people, of the people, we need to embody that in the sense that the people that are working in the community need to understand how this code works. They need to understand the machines that they're building and, and, and to know specifically that they're, they're uh, genuinely in service to their strengths rather than to their weaknesses, that they're genuinely contributing to health rather than not. Um, and, and so, you know, on one hand, you know, you asked, can we use machinery to identify health? And yes, we can. Um, but it's, it's more a question of can we think about what health means well enough so that we can know that the machinery is actually helping us to identify genuine health? You know, it's not necessarily going to be like a number on a dashboard. It's going to be more like a, a series of, of, of threshold conditions that basically say, you know, all of these things need to be true. And if any of them are not true, something is probably wrong and we need to start doing diagnosis. Yeah. So, you know, if, if, if people start coughing a lot or they start getting sick or, or you know, we, we find ourselves having to deal with acute situations all of the time and we're no longer ever thinking about chronic problems, then you know there's there's essentially a lack lack of resilience there's a lack of health yeah. and so you know in effect i don't want to get caught up in the problem of developing the dashboard while the rest of us are basically dying dying yeah so 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 in a sense there's a there, there's there's a real need to understand the notion of appropriate technology and what the relationship again between man and machine and nature the genuine healthy uh, ecological sense actually looks like um, which is which is a part of going back to the question you, you you sort of started with, which was, you know, what what does it mean to 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 basically create a thriving community, or what does it mean to 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 live in a in a world that's worth living in 100 years from now? Yeah, a couple of things I want to just uh, bookmark there. One of the things you said is when the machines cater to our weakness, and so I want to you know, like like so we're flipping to that social feed because we're lonely. That's catering to weakness. That's right. It is not actually making us more connected, more vulner more vulnerability here, more intimacy there, more you know, more for fulfillment. It is literally just keeping us in the weak state so we continue to consume. Uh, that's I want to just make sure that people understand that as a notion. And then the other notion is that, that optimization problem. You know, we're we've been optimization optimizing for wealth extraction or money extraction, and money is an abstract notion. But we can measure people's attention, for example, in the, the, the um, social media economy, and that turns into wealth. So they're, they're extracting our time and attention for, for wealth. And that's an optimization. You know, it's just, that's what our economy 
gives incentives for is optimizing, optimizing around those routes. You, in, in order to actually imagine a different kind of optimization, it has nothing to do with the machines. It has to do with humans and culture. We have to decide that a different kind of optimization is what's required. Um, and then require that the, the in our you know our commons, our, which it may be a digital commons, that people behave in in, a, in accordance to whatever we think is uh, needs to be optimized for, and that's a I mean, that's a big that's a big deal. It's it's not just a matter of a bunch of coders sitting down and figuring out how to to do something. It's having a bunch of human beings sitting around and deciding, wow, wealth extraction or or, or turning you know uh, natural resources and human resources into wealth. Is not what we want to optimize our our society or civilization for. Then we got to choose something else, and it seems like that's one of the more more daunting. Uh, well, that's that's kind of what 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 what's really interesting about this. And so, you know, at first, if we if we basically say, okay, what happened here? Well, because of market processes, you know, we we ended up optimizing for wealth creation. Well, what was it that, that 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 caused that to happen? I mean, what is what is the preconditions that that is the you know the privatization of of wealth that, that people are seeking? Well, you know, you can you can go back to biological preconditions and propensities that that individuals have. I mean, if we're if we're looking at things from a survival point of view, um, you know, it's 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 actually pretty pretty straightforward to um, develop the the sufficient capacities to continue to survive. But if you're looking at you know, family selection uh, processes, you know, mate selection kinds of things, then and it's a relative comparison that's being made. And and so in effect, you end up with people optimizing for a prestige or status or uh, the kinds of things that will differentially, um, you know, show show them as, as being preferable to the neighbor, so to speak. And, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, we, we are kind of unconscious about our own fundamental natures. And that unconsciousness of our own fundamental natures is leading us into behavior patterns that collectively are creating, um, you know, short-term wins for some number of people, right? So we, we we start getting really good at playing these games, what we call game A. And uh, some people are winners and other people are losers, and this sort of inequality thing shows up. And the people that are really good players optimize for playing better, and they get this sort of you know, exaggerated advantage, um, and but their but their sense making capacity because they don't really understand themselves or the world that they're working in very well, uh, hasn't actually gotten any better. So they end up making poor choices and resources are squandered, and then eventually the system crashes. So, you know, we, we could go back and say, well, inequality is the problem. You know, when you, when you have substantial inequality, you don't have enough information flowing through the system in the appropriate ways. Make good choices. Sense making gets degraded, but wisdom necessary to do that sense making was already uh, essentially chosen against because the wisdom started in the space of literally understanding what the real problem is so yeah on one level we can say inequality basically drives civilization collapse and that market systems uh, basically don't have the capacity to think long term they they're very um, feedback oriented they're short term responsive you mentioned uh, you know trying to get people to think long term and and I completely agree, right? So, so in effect, what we're what we're observing here is, is that neither governance in the in the usual sense nor market process in the usual sense, in the first case because of politics, in the second case because of quarterly yields, um, can really think long term. Like neither of those are forums in which long term thinking, responsive thinking, health oriented thinking, or adaptiveness, or community process support, or any of that other kind of stuff can't really occur in those contexts. And so. You know, and, and, and the reason for that is is because we, you know, a lot of times, even in our thinking about these things, we are we're still looking for a quick fix. But but the problem is 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 more in the space of our understanding of our fundamental natures, our understanding of what it looks like when a person is caught in the habit, you know, much like any other addiction, caught in the habit of of creating something that is designed to entrap other people to be able to charge rent over long term. So you have honeypot seeking um, or honeypot creation. You know, I'm going to create this beautiful uh, device and I'm going to give it all sorts of features. And then, um, you know, the next phase would be sort of this entrapment kind of thing where first you entangle them, 
you say, well, in order to have that, you have to give us your credit card. You also got to give us all of your personal information. And, uh, you know, once we have your network of social network and so on and so forth, then we can go into, you know, well, actually running this thing is really expensive and we're going to need to raise the, the rent that, that, that we're charging you to use this service. And so, you know, in effect, without some sort of compulsion in the middle, without some sort of honeypot to, to drive it, you don't get the extortion capacity at the end. So, um, in, in effect, you know, we, we as a as a culture, you know, we'll, we'll spend a whole bunch of time uh, in uh, school, you know, grade school, high school, college, you know, professional degrees and so on, teaching people how to get better and better at making addictive systems, get better and better creating um, entrapment scenarios, how to get ahead as an academic or how to get ahead as a, as a, as a CEO or how to, how to basically, you know, play the game better. But, but at some point or another, when things start breaking down, uh, a few of us start looking at, you know, is this the right game to play at all? Right. Um, you know, people sometimes ask me, you know, uh, what would be a good book to read? And I, and I, I, I've, I've come to start habitually recommending this thing called Finite and Infinite Games by James P. Cars. Right? Finite games played to win, but an infinite game is played to continue playing. And so when you when you when you recognize that game A just isn't the right game. And the game theory itself has certain assumptions built into it that fundamentally preclude any possibility of understanding or recognizing what a solution even looks like. When you recognize that, that, that even the notion of game theory, the way it's currently conceived, fundamentally the problem, right? That, that in effect, we need to upgrade the tools with which we are regarding the sense-making process, the, the tools with which we recognize what the sensibilities are behind skillfulness and beauty and goodness and meaningfulness really are. Um, I've had the fortune, very, very good fortune. I, I, I spent uh, the first part of my life basically thinking a lot about metaphysics, which is basically asking a what question. You know, science and, and technology are basically answers to a why question. Why does this happen? So causal theories and Mathematics are very, very good methods of, of, of working with, obviously, science and technology because they have that sort of structure built into them. But if you're wanting to answer, you know, questions like, well, what is the fundamental nature of time? Or, you know, all of the things that physics basically takes for granted, such as, you know, what is space and what is matter? And, you know, we could talk about how those things relate, but or why they relate in that particular way, but just getting down to the nature of the isness of it, right? The ontology and the epistemology. And, and, and you know, again, these things seem like really, really abstract concepts, but, but, but what it does is it gives you a tool set to think about things like ethics, about what meaning means, about what value and purpose really are, about, you know, what is beauty and, 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 the, the, the fundamental nature of a good choice, right? So if we're, if we're trying to develop skillfulness, the ability to make better choices in situation, a very practical, fundamental kind of thing. So, you know, I, I, I find myself uh, oftentimes wanting to have a, a real, um, you know, a, a, a real sense of connectedness, not just with myself, but with the world and with other people. There's a skillfulness and availability and a willingness to make that happen. And so, in, in effect, what 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 the what the metaphysics does is it gives you a way of genuinely, deeply understanding the nature of the relationships behind choices, the nature of the relationships behind, behind skillfulness. And so, having that tool set. Um, I've 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 been able to see things in a way that is 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 somewhat deeper and, and, and somewhat more tuned to the nature of the of the of the unique problems that are facing us as a species. Um, and and so in, in that particular sense, you know, while on, on on some respects it's like wow, there's this really abstract set of tools, found a way to bring them into genuine practice in a way that matters to real people in real time. And um, that's been actually quite satisfying. It's been it's been very uh, beautiful to. To experience that, because I think that in in, in some respects, I, you know, I I for longest time for for a couple of decades had really even thought that I'd ever see any of this happen in my lifetime. Right. 
Um, so I'm, I'm in effect beginning to, to witness, um, you know, basically uh, these concepts and these ideas begin to be deployed in practice to uh, real and necessary effect. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, I'd recommend you you pick up James Carson's book, uh, Finite and Infinite Games. And it, if you're going to pick it up, you might as well just go ahead and get 10 copies. And honestly, if you can make it through the first 34 pages, you know, you, you can kind of have your mind blown by that. I mean, there's a bunch of social psychology stuff in the middle of the book and really kind of deep, deep thinking. But uh, yeah, keep a, keep a stack of them and hand them out. Um, it's kind of one of, to me, I think it's one of the fundamental texts of, of like, of the, 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 the shift in mindset that even gives you a possibility to have the panorama to understand that we could create an underlying, uh, you know, game structure, underlying way of interacting with each other that is mutually beneficial in, in every condition. Um, and that, you know, uh, 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 that book and, and, and James, I've been in contact with some over the, the past couple of years. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's access. It's like, it's like one of those, those golden doorways into, oh, that's how I meant to be thinking about that. That's how I meant to, to say it. Um, and then, you know, I think, you know, when you start, like we, we just started going off into that territory, which I think is so important for humanity to kind of a little bit more en masse grab a hold of. And that's, you know, deciding that, you know, like dis dis even distinguishing the difference between epistemology and ontology to get, a, get their hands wrapped around a little bit of what is a phenomenological experience, you know, where is the, I, where is my experience in this? And, um, now, these are upgrades in consciousness that are not new for human beings. It is, you know, like, you know, we can trace the roots, all of these conversations back to, to you know, the, the uh, age of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, uh, when they were trying to grapple with the basic nature of reality as a conversation. Um, and it still seems that, that, that our, the pace of the development of our physical, structural society has outpaced our capacity to keep up in a cultural and I want to say intellectual because it really does start with thinking, but it is also relational and, and, and emotionally centered capacity. And, and I think a little bit of what we're doing here is to, to try to catch up. Like, I mean, it, it's not like this, like I said, like this thinking is new. It's just how do we get it to be part of the structure and warp and weave of, of daily life? Um, and in all those regards, I want to I want to thank you for you know like you doing the thinking, but you're also doing the design work. You're also thinking about the applications of these things, and that's a that's a bit of a rare breed to both be able to think about deeply and to uh, you know create designs and things like that. So I really appreciate that. Um, it's actually quite satisfying. I, I I at this point have uh, like I said, it's 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 genuinely pleasurable to have an idea. And then that same day, you know, you wake up and you, you, you're inspired. You have, this, you have this thing you just figured out how to do. And then literally to be able to walk into a shop that, that, that's your own, that's prepared for you, and to build something and to try that idea out, right, to, to, to basically find out, you know, within, within a few hours, if you're skillful enough and have the resources to, to, to make something, to, to, to basically test a concept. Right. Um, so, so in a lot of ways, you know, I've, I've – I've, I, I find myself at, at, at this juncture feeling quite privileged to be able to, you know, think about it and bring it to practice, to have, you know, on one hand a seat at the table to, 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 to even be in the conversation, to be talking to you like this, and then at the same time, um, you know, to, to, to be able to experience it in some embodied and manifest way. Um, you know, obviously at, at, at this point, um, the limiting factors are not so much uh, you know what's what's going on in the conceptual space. It's more in the embedding space. It's it's how do we bring these ideas into practice in a way that many people can relate to and actually begin to use. Um, and and so you know like for instance going back to the to the James P. Carr's thing. Um, so you know the the end result of reading that book is the recognition of the difference between game A and game B. Yeah. Right. So you know what he's calling infinite games. A lot of people have taken to calling game B, but. You know, then the next layer, the next level is essentially becoming skillful at recognizing the kinds of entrapments, the sheer variety of, 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 of entanglements that, that, that the people are creating and, the, and noticing in ourselves the habit of creating those same entanglements, the, the sort of, you know, the pain of loss of community process as manifest in the 
in the notions of how one proceeds. So, you know, like in the United States, for example, there's this there's this thing, life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness. It sounds great on the surface until, you know, people start pointing out that that level of individualism, if taken too far, can, can create some real harm. You know, we have so much privatization of value and so much extraction going on, there's so much parasitic process, so much of that has, has resulted in such a level of inequality that the world is suffering. Um, but at the same time, you know, when we, when, we, when we look at, well, where did that come from? What is that about? And, and we see, you know, substantial abuses of collective action. So, for instance, you know, you have institutions, you have you know, some petty dictator or king or whatever, and they, 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 they basically, you know, the, the notion of the social contract is that they are, you know, their, their charter is to protect the land and the people, right? That's what a government's supposed to do. That's the fundamental uh, trust of, 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 of any representative system. And, you know, time and time again, we see that, um, you know, a lot of times that, that, that the people that are in positions of power, you know, are corrupt in this, they're, they're using that power to their own ends rather than actually protecting the land and the people. So on one hand, you know, we can look at this, this uh, COVID-19 thing and we can basically say, okay, to what degree did the federal government protect the land and the people? Well, actually, not at all. I mean, just flat out. I mean, like fundamentally. So I'm, I'm just, I'm just basically making an observation here. I'm not trying to condemn them or anything. I'm basically saying they were incapable of doing something about the solution before, before it happened. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the thing is, is that to some extent, our uh, assumption that representative system would be able to do anything else was probably needing to be questioned, right? And so, um, in effect, we, we, we now come back to, okay, well, how do we recognize the habits that we all have growing up in the civilization? Just do things the same way it's always been done, which are no longer working for us. What got us here, what got us from the past to the present, will not get us from the present into the future. There's a shift that is needed, and the shift isn't the kind of shift that, that, that's basically going to happen because somebody invented a warp drive. It's not going to happen because somebody figured out how to rewrite the entire genetic code of a human being and make them into some sort of god. It's going to because, be because we, we understand ourselves, we understand nature, and we understand you know, machinery, basically, with enough compassion, with enough skillfulness, with enough recognition of the things that actually matter, that we can begin to embody that meaningfulness in a first-hand sense rather than some abstract way. And so, you know, right now we are so deeply admired in the habits of, oh, uh, we create representative systems and then we vote, and that's the sense-making we do to solve policy problems. And, you know, we all just basically put up with it because we don't have a better way, right? Uh, I think Churchill was the one who said something along the lines of democracy is the worst form of government except all the others. So in effect, for like a thousand years, nobody has thought of a better way to do this. Well, partly it's because they didn't have the tools necessary to even be able to have the conversation to really think about it. So on one hand, while we can go back to Plato and Aristotle and, 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 and great thinkers out of, out of other traditions, you know, Eastern philosophies and so on, um, that, that, that have really contributed a lot of value to this conversation. We need to recognize that there is a set of tools that we've only recently acquired as a species that allows us to now have a set of conversations that have never happened before, that effectively upgrade our capacity to think about what it means to be in good governance, and that by using those tools, we now begin to start answering questions that we've never been able to answer in a satisfactory way. Like, what would be a substantially better way of thinking about all of these problems than anyone has ever done? Like, orders of magnitude better, right? We're not talking incrementally better. Okay, we've come up with a slightly better way of voting. You know, we're gonna do quadratic voting or we're gonna do runoff or something like that. Those are incremental changes. They don't reflect the level of deep thinking that's necessary to solve the genuine problems that we're now faced with. So part of it is, is that I'm, I'm basically, uh, you know, through the proxy of other people, trying to provide a sense of educational methodology so that we can begin to speak a language that has the capacity to hold the solution within it. 
and that by effectively having that perception of what the problem is and what the solution is, what characteristics the solution would, would need to have, that we can begin to recognize the solution. Um, and, and, you know, that, that starts on, on, on a personal level. It starts on a small community level. It becomes uh, essentially a kind of almost monastic discipline, but it's not religious. Right. And, and so, in, in, in effect, there's, a, there's, there's, there's just for, for what, what I'm essentially experiencing is this, is this huge panoply of ingredients. And now I can sort of see the constellation of the ingredients, and I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to sort of say, okay, well, if we take that piece and we combine it with this one, We'll end up with something that can engage with this, which can connect with that, and before long, we can then start to have a conversation that is is generative, genuinely generative. Um, and 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 so in, in that particular sense, you know, it, it begins with with a, a a kind of re understanding of the world in which we live in, a re understanding of what it means to be human, or what it means to be in a healthy relationship, or what an ecosystem genuinely is. And so, you know, in those, and I'm referring to those concepts, but I'm not, I'm not trying to draw on the left way of thinking about them or the right way of thinking about them. I'm just trying to give a pointer, the direction that needed to go in in order to address this. So the finite and infinite games is, is like a doorway. If you can walk through that, then at least you know that there's a bifurcating path. And then if you, if you get through that doorway, we need to become wiser about the nature of ourselves. So we can be recognizing the way in which other people are oftentimes in self-deceit and therefore not only deceiving themselves but also deceiving us. So to see clearly, to move beyond the desire for either using complexity to solve complexity problems or simplicity to basically be a reaction to that, move into genuine clarity. And from that place, then we can begin to walk in a way that matters. Wow, I think um, I think that sums it up for me. <laughs> uh, wow, uh, Forrest, thank you for uh, this time. Um, you know, in this moment, you know, many people are are open to looking for new solutions in a way they've not been before. And I don't I don't know if that means they're open enough that we see some kind of radical shifts in our society and culture. But I, I do think an opening is an opening, and uh, we're very interested in in you know shoving that door as wide open as we can in the in the, the time that we have to do that, uh, disruption is always a friend of change. Uh, now, it's a it's a friend of other kinds of changes that we'd actually not like to have visit. Uh, you know, there's certainly nationalistic and totalitarian impulses out there that I'm sure are really excited about this moment as well. Um, but uh, thank you for your thinking and your words today. Um, I'm very, very pleased to have had this conversation with you, and I'm going to walk away enriched. I've got lots of things to uh, think about and mull myself. Uh, and I'm sure they'll come to completion. We'll have another conversation soon.